How you doing, everybody? Welcome back to Stand Focus for Jesus. In this sermon, we are going to be addressing um, some so-called contradictions in the Bible. In regards to this whole loving your neighbor as you love yourself and hating your enemy and um, different things in the Bible where it talks about hate love and stuff like that so we're going to start our um two our two main foundational scriptures are going to be matthew chapter 5 verses 43 through 48 and then after that we're going to jump to luke chapter 14 verse 26 so let's start in matthew it reads ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So, in verse 43, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. In the past, it was said, that was said. But we have to get an understanding of what is he talking about when he talks about hating your enemy. You see, when we think about hate today, we have this notion of malice, this notion of, of um, shedding innocent blood. We have this, this notion of, um, of just something that's just, just pure evil when we speak about the word hate. Then in verse 44 again, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. What the Lord is telling us is to go above and beyond what others are doing to you in the same way our father if we are children of our father which is in heaven then we are following in his footsteps in the same way that Jesus the works that Jesus did he did the same things that his father did so the same thing the father did the same thing that Jesus did the same thing that the original 12 apostles did, excluding Judas Iscariot, um, it's the same things that we are supposed to be doing, which is we make the sun the rise on the evil and on the good. We send the rain on the just and the unjust. We show love. We show mercy. We show grace to those who are evil, who we would consider our enemies, and those who would be our brothers and sisters in Christ. So he said again, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Now, if we go down to Luke chapter 14, verse 26, he says, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. But wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. So here he's telling us to hate our family and to hate ourselves, but up there he's telling us to love our to love our enemies. That would make it seem like the Bible is contradicting itself. Right? But it's not. It's not 
contradicting itself. You must have an understanding of the context. You must have an understanding of how, of how God is defining things. You see, when you define hatred by the way the world defines it, then you don't have an understanding of what the scriptures are saying. So you're going to read and you're like, oh, well, why do you tell us to, um, in the past, to hate our enemies? Now he's telling us to love our enemies. And now he's telling us to hate our family. That doesn't make any sense. It sounds like he's like schizophrenic or double-minded. But God is not double-minded. So what is it? Are we supposed to love our enemies? Are we supposed to hate hate our um, father and mother or, and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even our own selves? Let's get an understanding. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, the context of he, when he's talking about hate is talking about to love less. If any man come to me and love less, not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. If you love your family and even your own self more than you love the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are not worthy of him. If you have excuses, or oh, I got to take care of my, my father, I got to take care of my mother, I got to take care of my wife, my children, all these different things. If you love those things more than you love Jesus, then you cannot be his disciple. People idolize family. People idolize their wife or their spouse. People idolize their children. People idolize their own life. If you do not put these things below Jesus and have Jesus as your head, then you cannot be his disciple. Because in him is how you learn how to truly treat your family. So he's saying, put the teachings that you have learned from this world aside and come to me so I can truly teach you how to love. Now we're going to go to Luke chapter 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So here again, he's telling us to hate to hate the other one. Either we're going to hate God or love God. Either we're, either we're going to um, hate um, serving mammon or we're going to love serving mammon. But I thought we're not supposed to hate. The Bible says to love your enemies, right? So we're supposed to love our enemies. Does, doesn't that mean, wouldn't that include Satan? Because Satan is our enemy. So we can't just sit here and say, oh yeah, see, it says love your enemies, and then just take it at face value. What's the, what's the wisdom behind it? What's the context? Because again, a person, a person can easily say, if we're supposed to love our enemies, then you must love Satan. And we know dang well, we don't love Satan. We hate him. Oh, I thought we weren't supposed to hate. But you know you hate Satan. So, you're either going to serve God or you're going to serve mammon. So if we go back up, he's telling them to, um, to love them less. He's saying the same thing. You have to love money less. You, have, you cannot live to serve money and uh, accumulate all this money, which is the culture that we are living in in America. Because there's nothing wrong with getting money. It's when people make money, they're God. When people, they serve money. Money is supposed to be serving you. You're not supposed to be serving money. Are we understanding so far? Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse number six. He says, thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. So he says this about 
his enemies in the Old Testament. This is what he was talking about. If we go back up, ye have heard that it hath, past tense, been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. The hatred toward the enemies was this that you were not seeking their peace nor their prosperity all the days, all thy days. But today, when he's talking about love your enemies, you what? You are extending peace toward them. You want them, you want them to be prosperous. The peace that we are extending toward our enemies is the gospel, the gospel of peace. So if, again, if we go back up to the very first scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy, en thy enemy. If you were hating your enemy, you weren't wishing peace for your enemy in the sense of wanting them to be saved because there's even wisdom in regards to peace. As you're going to see, there's different types of peace. There's a peace that you have for salvation. There's, excuse me, there's a peace that you receive when you have salvation. There's a general type of peace. Again, in verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. How do you love your enemies? You love your enemies by speaking the truth to them. When they curse you. You bless them. What does it mean when it's talking about bless your enemies? It's talking about that you're still showing and extending them love. You're still wanting, wanting them to be humbled because when you look up the word bless, it means, it means to be humble, to be humbled. Also, depending on what, uh, what source you're using, it deals with to be baptized. So when it's talking about loving your enemies, it's talking about you want your enemies, even though they're coming against you and ultimately coming against Christ, you still want them to be baptized into the love of God. It's not talking about Letting, letting them run all over you. It's not talking about this hatred that the world has painted and what it shows us. It's not, that's not what it's talking about. That's not what it's talking about. The stuff that you see on TV, the murder, the lying, the, the deceit is not talking about that when he's talking about hatred. And remember, we battle not against flesh and blood. So you should want your enemy to be saved. You should want your enemies to be blessed in the Lord. How do you be blessed in the Lord? They have to be saved. Because if you just do what they're doing, then you're no better than them. If you only show grace and mercy to those who already have grace and mercy, then you're no different from your enemies. When Jesus went up against Satan, what did he do? He spoke the truth to him. He spoke the scriptures. The scriptures are love. Being rebuked is love. If you're doing it from a pure... Uh, um, pure heart. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. What did he do? What did he do? He rebuked Satan. Even though Satan hated him, he still was, in, in a sense, showing love to Satan. Excuse me. Because God is love. Jesus is love. He was manifesting that love through, through the word. And guess what? Satan hates that. Satan doesn't want us to manifest love to him. He wants us to manifest hatred to him. That 
malice, hatred, like, oh, I just want to, because he feeds off of that, because now he got you in the trap, because it ain't really for him. He, he gets he gets glory from that, yes, but it's now you have been ensnared in his trap, because most likely you're going to go manifest that, that, that type of hatred to somebody else. That's what he wants. He doesn't want the brotherly love. He wants brother, physical brother and physical brother to be fighting against each other. He wants physical sister and physical sister to fight against each other. He doesn't want that brotherly love that we have in Christ. He hates that. So we go to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17. Remember what, uh, excuse me, remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way. When ye were come, when ye were come forth out of Egypt. So they were supposed to remember what Amalek did and then recompense Amalek for what he had done to them. We're not supposed to be holding grudges. Y'all have heard me talk about the things I went through with my with my, my mother. You've heard the things I went through with my father. Well, I should say my, uh, my dad, I don't call him, I don't call him father because he was not a father back then. And he's not a father today. A, fa a father, the term father is a specific term. I, I give him the term dad, the title dad. But you know, the different things I went through with, with my dad, he tried to, to Deliver me up to Satan as a as a sacrifice through Freemasonry. So I could easily remember those different things that they did. The different things that I went through with my family. And I can hold that that as a, a grudge, seeds of resentment, seeds of bitterness. But I don't do that. I remember the things that I went through with them as a testimony. So I can do better and I can share with y'all. But I don't hold it against them. In regards to seeds of bitterness and and hatred, that that type of uh, unrighteous hatred, because there is a righteous hatred. I don't hold that against them. I still extend them love because guess what? My dad is my enemy. Why? Because he stands directly against the gospel. But if my dad ever came to me or even sometime when I'm around him, if I had an opportunity, I give him the gospel. I speak about Jesus. Sometimes I don't. But guess what? At the end of the day, he still know what's up. I don't do I don't do evil for evil with him. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Or Mar Maranatha. This is pretty much saying, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let them be greatly, uh, greatly cursed to the divine judgment. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let them be greatly cursed to the divine judgment. Judgment. Now, I thought the scripture just told us that we are supposed to bless our enemies, pray for them. But here it's saying, if they don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, to pretty much let them be not just cursed, but greatly cursed to divine, to the divine judgment. The judgment that 
we're not going to be a part of. The great white throne judgment, the judgment of being put into hell and then being resurrected so they can be cast into the lake of fire. That judgment, this is what this scripture is saying. But I thought we were supposed to love our enemies. You see, what you have to understand is this. The gospel is being preached. Many people have heard the gospel over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Yet they still continue to reject the gospel. They still continue to claim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bringing reproach against his name. That's why Jesus said, and even the Old Testament, Moses said, thou should not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. People think it just talks about, oh, uh, you know, saying GD, you know, y'all know what I'm saying, GD. They think it's just talking about stuff like that. But it's talking about taking on his name, living the lifestyle of a believer, yet you're being a hypocrite. That's more so what it's speaking about when it's talking about not taking his name in vain. Because when you're taking up the name, you're taking up the family of God. You're taking up everything that goes along with it. But again, I thought we were supposed to love our enemies, bless them that curse us, do good to them that hate us. We are. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that we aren't obligated to continue to preach to those who continue to reject the gospel. Now, if they come to you in a sincere heart, then yes, you are obligated to extend that grace and mercy to them right then. But if you continue to preach to them and they continue to reject, they don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, yet they're claiming they do, and they're, they're bearing false witness against his name, they're bearing false witness against us, then guess what? Let them be anathema maranatha. It's a serious stuff. So why would it tell us that? Why would it tell us to love our enemies, and then another another uh, part of the Bible we're reading right now is telling us to let them that don't love Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, let them be greatly cursed to the divine judgment. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hmm. Who is this going to hell? Who is this going to everlasting fire? When we read the context of it, and many of you know, it's speaking about those, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these wonderful works in thy name? Cast out devils in thy name? Heal the sick in thy name? Preach in thy name. Then what, what does he say? Depart from me, ye workers of inequity. Hypocrites. A person is a, is a hypocrite because they are purposely being a hypocrite. They're taking the name of the Lord God Almighty. They're taking the name of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ. They understand um, the knowledge, the wisdom and understanding of God. They understand the gospel. They understand these different things. They're preaching it to people, but they're using it to glorify themselves. Yet they are still living this double life. These are your anathema, Mary, not the people. Your T.D. Jakes your Joel Osteen's, your Oprah's, your Beyonce's, your Jay-Z's. Oh, you got to pray for, you got to pray for them, brother. I pray for them, all right. 
I pray for him. I pray for him to be brought down and to be humbled mightily. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Do I want to see them go to hell? Absolutely not. But they have to be brought down before they can be saved. But I'm not going to go too deep into that in regards to who they really are. Because some of you think that these people, that they are literal people, mankind. But when you're walking in the spirit, God shows you different things. You can see that these people, some of the people I just named, they are literal tears in this flesh. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. See, see, forgive, forgive. What did he say after that? Why did Jesus say to, why did Jesus say to his father to forgive them? For they know not what they do. For they know not what they do. Jesus asked the Father to forgive them. People, people quote the scripture all the time. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yet these people have blasphemy, blasphemy the Holy Spirit for thirty years, and people still, Father, forgive them, for they know not, know not what they do. Father, forgive them. Oh, they know what they're doing. That was the key to it. Jesus asked the Father to forgive them because they didn't know what they were doing. Jesus has extended mercy and grace to us for so long, many of us, including myself, when I was lost and when you were lost. Why? How did you get saved? Did you, ever, did you ever wonder? I was doing all this wickedness, and I know people that died way before me. Because... Many of us, when we were doing the sins that we were doing, we did not know what we were doing. We didn't have a true understanding. We were ignorant because it's the way it was the way that we were raised. It was it was what we were taught. I grew up thinking that it was cool to sleep with multiple women. I grew up thinking it was cool to to chase money, to serve to to serve money. I grew up thinking it was cool to be prideful and idolatrous. Why? Because that's what I was taught. It wasn't until I started getting late into my late twenties. I'm only thirty five years old, twenty seven, twenty eight. I was, you know, what I'm saying that was when I felt like I was like grown. I was, you know, what I'm saying feeling myself. But yeah, I'm the man. It wasn't until then. So majority of my life, I was ignorant to the things that I was doing. Now, yeah, I had a sense that they were wrong. But I don't I didn't have an understanding like I have now. That's why when I talk to my son. When he does something wrong, I don't only tell him that he has done something wrong, but I explain it to him. Hey, we don't do that. This is why we don't do that. He's two years old, but the boy listens. The boy is smart. See, our parents used to tell us not to do stuff all the time. But not enough times, at least for me, and I'm pretty sure many of you can attest to this, We it wasn't explained to us why we shouldn't be doing something. I'm not saying a parent has to explain to a child every time but sometimes you got to sit that child down and explain to them why they shouldn't be doing certain things so they can have that wisdom to go with it. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Ain't really, it's not too many excuses in 2019 in these last days. It's not too many excuses. God is pouring out his mercy and grace 
like never before. Wanting people to be saved. And people are purposely, purposely rejecting him, purposely spitting in his face. They know he's God. They know who he is. They can't run from it because it's written in their DNA code. Yeah, I know who you are. I remember that love I once had. But I'm going to spit in your face. I'm going to piss on the blood of Jesus. I'm going to defecate right there in front of your throne. And I dare you to say something or do something about it, God. That's not ignorance. That's willful sin. That's willful blasphemy. That's willful hatred. That is willfully walking in the power and spirit of Satan. You ever wonder why Satan, God is so merciful, but God didn't forgive Satan. There are scriptures that I can show you where God did extend grace and mercy to Satan when he was Lucifer. We know he became Satan. But Satan was so prideful, and still is, that he never came to God for that grace and mercy. He never, he never really wanted it. And if he did, he wasn't never truly sincere about it. You see, we think that just we think, we think that God just he just wanted to cast Satan into to hell. He wanted he wanted to just cast Satan and his angels into hell forever to hell with them. Make God out to some like he's some type of monster. No, it was Satan that didn't want God's grace and mercy, which he 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 wrote his own destiny. There was a time period. Before, <laughs> you could say around the first earth age, maybe before that, that God would have extended, their, I mean, God had that opportunity of grace and mercy for him, but he rejected it. Let us also remember that uh, Satan used to physically rule this world. He was literally on this earth ruling under the authority of God. That's why he said in um, Isaiah, I will ascend up into the heavens. I will ascend above the stars. I will sit in the, in the um, mount of the congregation of the north. To, if you're ascending, you're going, you're going up. So that tells us that Satan had already fall, fallen, fallen. But that gets into some of the other stuff that we have discussed before. Luke chapter 12, verses 47 through 48. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. So the servant, what he knew his Lord's will and he didn't prepare himself, nor did he do what his, his, his Lord told him to do. What will happen to him? He will be beaten with many stripes. Now let, let's get a deeper understanding of that. The Bible says what? By his stripes. So why would we have to be beaten with many stripes when we've already, when Jesus has already taken the beating for us? So you see what type of servant this really was. 
He knew what was up. He knew what he was supposed to be doing. But he that knew not was in ignorance, right? If you, didn't, if you don't know something, that means you're ignorant of something. We are all ignorant about something in a sense. None of us know everything. But as you grow in Christ, the ignorance is removed more and more to different things. That's where the light should be shining brighter and brighter. The more ignorance that's removed, the more enlightenment you receive, then the more responsible you are supposed to be with that enlightenment that you have received, which means you're supposed to bring forth that much more fruit. Or you're just like the servant, which knew his Lord's will, and you prepared not yourself, neither did you do according to his will. You was a false convert. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes, sin, inequity, shall be beaten with few stripes. Because they were ignorant. But they still got to get the punishment because they knew inwardly. You know what's wrong to steal. Nobody got to tell you. You know what's wrong to sleep with somebody else's uh, husband or wife. Nobody got to tell you that. But do you have an understanding of, of the, the consequences of that? You see, we all used to commit sin. We all used to live for sin. But we didn't have an understanding of the consequences to our actions. We knew it was wrong to steal. But we still did it anyway. But we didn't have we didn't have an understanding of the consequences. I remember one time I was went to Walmart with my mama when I was younger. And I stole something with my mama. Oh, I was bold back then to do wicked. <laughs> I stole I, it was a it was a um it was a PlayStation controller. It was kind of it was rain. I remember it was raining. It was kind of gloomy. I had my jacket on. And when my mom said, you want to go to Walmart with me? I made up my mind, yeah, I want to go because I knew I was going to go. I wanted to steal something because I wanted a new PlayStation controller. Got to Walmart. My mom was doing her thing. I got that controller. She found out I stole it. I think she beat the brakes off me too. <laughs> she probably, she probably, I probably got a whoop and I blacked out. <laughs> Because she understood what she she rightfully if she if she whooped me I can't remember that but I'm pretty sure my mama probably whooped me if she didn't whoop me physically then she she whooped me with her words but she had an understanding of the consequences of my actions now what does it look like if I get caught stealing in a store with my mom. That's not only embarrassing for me, but it's also embarrassing for her. Are we understanding? So she had, she, I was ignorant. I didn't, you know, yeah, I knew it was wrong to steal, but I wasn't thinking about, oh yeah, if I get caught, this is going to be bad for me. If I get caught, hey, I'm, I might get shot. We see it going on today. It was going on way back then. The, only, the difference is now is we have what we call social media. It's been going on. They could have called the police on me and I could have got shot or anything. I didn't have an understanding of the effects if I would have got caught in the store or the name of what it would have did to the family name. I, didn't, I wasn't thinking about, oh, how did how does this affect my mom or my dad? I wouldn't think I wouldn't think about that. I was ignorant to that. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, y'all hear me quote the scripture all the time. For unto whomsoever much is given. 
of him shall be much required. So the more enlightenment that God has given you, which means that you are less ignorant to, um, you, um, you're less ignorant to different things, then more will be required of you. That's why you got to be careful what you pray for. You are here praying for knowledge, for wisdom, for understanding. You're, you're praying for all these things to be increased. But are you in a position in your heart to truly do what you're supposed to do with those different things that you're praying for? You're praying for a family in Christ. But are you in the right position mentally, spiritually, to receive a family in Christ, meaning you want a wife or you want a husband and you want a, a child of a child that's you know, conceived in righteousness. Are you in a position mentally, physically, excuse me, spiritually? Are you in a position spiritually to receive that and then to do what you're supposed to do with it, with your family? Because having a family, it's, that's a big responsibility. Next to ministry, my family is, is, is the biggest responsibility I have. I got a whole grown wife I got to take care of. I got a baby boy that I have to mold into the man that God has called him to be or help do that. I have to lay that, help lay that foundation. That, that's my job. On top of preaching and getting all these videos out and doing it in a timely, ma in a, in a timely manner running my household and making sure is the ship is heading the way it's supposed to balancing that. And you know what I'm saying? Loving my wife and spending time with her and everything. It's easy in love, but don't get it twisted and think that, you know, it's not a task. I do it because that's what I was made for. But I'm all, I can't sit there and say, yeah, you know, it's easy. Now I, I don't do anything. No, I'm responsible. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. I pray for knowledge. I pray for wisdom. I pray for understanding. I pray for my love to be increased. And with all these things, if God is increasing it, he's expecting me to bring forth that much more fruit. This is why he gives us the different gifts he gives us to bring forth the fruit, the good fruit from the spirit. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. Same thing with God. If God has committed much unto you, then you don't think he's going to ask more of you. If God has committed a dollar to you, then he's, he's, he's expecting some type of return. But if he has committed a thousand dollars to somebody else, who you think he's looking for a bigger return from the person he gave a dollar or the person he gave a thousand dollars. Come on now. John chapter 15 verses 22 through 24. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have a true understanding of, of, of sin and the consequences of it. But guess what? Now he has come and he has spoken. And now people do not have a cloak, a covering for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. Now see, this is that worldly hate right here. That malicious hatred. People don't just hate Jesus. Because, yeah, you know, I hate him because he's false. They hate him like, oh, I want to kill him over and over and over again. This is the type of hatred that people have for Jesus. This is the type of hatred that people have for his father. They want to parade his body around and then they want to resurrect him from the dead. They want to kill him all over again. 
If people were in the position that God is in, they would kill God all over, over and over again. This is how sick and twisted these people are. Absolutely no mercy, no grace. That God is here ex is ex extending mercy and grace to his enemies who he knows wants to do these things to him and his people and his angels. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now... Have they both seen and hated both me and my father? Those that hate Jesus, they love death. So Jesus did these, these mighty works that nobody else did. Today, Jesus is doing this, this mighty work, resurrecting people from the dead and sending them out to give to, to give a testimony of that. This is what he's doing today. And because he has, he's doing this, they have no cloak, they have no covering for their sin. Because of what we testify about, that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. They hate Jesus. They hate his father. They hate the Holy Ghost. They hate us. They hate love. They hate righteousness. They hate the fruit of the spirits. And when I say hate, the hatred they have is that I want to kill you type of hatred. I want to murder you and bathe in your blood type of hatred. Not a love you less hatred as Jesus spoke about. Acts chapter 3 verse 17. No, let, me, let, let me add this because it just came to my spirit. Let me add this. When people think about pride, first thing you probably think about, oh, pride is bad, pride is bad. But I can show you scriptures in the Bible where pride is actually good. You may be saying, well, what are you talking about? That I don't believe that. Well, when you look at the word pride, you also see the word boast. And there are many scriptures that talk about boasting in the Lord. So you can be prideful toward the Lord, meaning you can boast in the Lord and the things that he has done. When you walk around with your chest puff, puffed out and uh, man, what you got your chest puffed out for? Oh, I'm the man. That would be self-righteous pride, right? Idolatry. You walking around with your head held up high, your back straight. Oh, you in a good mood. What's up? Oh, Jesus is good. Excuse me. God is good. Let me tell you what he did. I don't want to hear that. I have pride in the Lord, toward the Lord, because of what he did for me, the sacrifice that he made. You can catch me any day smiling. So you can either have it righteously or unrighteously. That's for the, for the more mature in the faith. I'm going to give you another example. When I say lust, you think about, oh, lust is bad, brother. Lust, that's bad. When you look at the word lust, you also see the word covet or covetous. And we speak about many times, oh, thou shalt not covet. 
and lust and stuff like that. When you are coveting unrighteously, unrighteously, when you are lusting unrighteously, of course it's wrong. But there are many scriptures where it says to what? To covet the gifts of God. Covetous, covet and lust, they go hand in hand. If I'm out in the streets and I'm lusting out the women that are not my wife, then guess what? That is unrighteous. That's sin. But if I'm if I'm in my car, I'm headed home, and I'm thinking about my wife and the things that I want to do to her and I'm going to do to her, I'm lusting after my wife. Have I committed sin? Absolutely not. I'm coveting to go home and to make love to my wife. Is it, have I sinned because of that? Absolutely not. I come home sometimes, I grab my wife and say, I tell her, you mine. And she be like, that's right. That right there is also for the ones who are more mature in the faith to understand these things. In the same way, you have a unrighteous hatred and a righteous hatred. Do you love Satan? You don't, so that means you hate him. But I thought you were supposed to love your enemies. Do you love Satan? You don't. Are we understanding? Are we understanding? Acts chapter 3, verse 17. And now, brethren, I want that, I want that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. How did they do it? The things they were doing that they weren't supposed to be doing, how did they do it? They did it through ignorance. First Timothy chapter one, verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Why did you obtain mercy, brother? Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The Apostle Paul, our brother, even Peter, when Peter denied Jesus and Jesus told him that you're going to deny, deny me three times, he did it ignorantly in unbelief. That's why Jesus got on him so much because he was right there with him. He was telling them these things. I, I, he's like, Jesus, I told you these things. Y'all still don't believe me? They had different moments. They had different moments, but it wasn't until later on when Jesus went through what he went through that they actually, they really, really got it. They really understood it. And even then it took them a while to understand it. The Apostle Paul did these different things. But God still extended mercy and grace to him because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. There's only a small group of people today that are committing sin and doing things ignorantly in unbelief because knowledge has increased the internet and all these different things, communication, YouTube, all these different things, being able to get the gospel out day, every day, several times a day. Some of you are on Facebook, some of you are on YouTube, some of you are on these social, social media platforms, just preaching the gospel, putting scriptures. These people are not in, these people are not ignorant in unbelief. They're willful. They're willfully doing these things. This is why God is not working in their life. He's still trying to get them to receive his mercy and grace, but the work is not being worked in their life like it's being worked in our life. Remember he said he, he said it rains on the just, he makes it to rain on the just and the unjust.
Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, if you go read the other versions, guess what it says? It says something to the likes of that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The Bible version doesn't matter. Even though it says, one of them says, angry without a cause, and the other one says, it takes that completely out, meaning that you can't be angry with your brother. This new age love, this um, hippie uh, positivity, think positive and everything positive. Because if you, God forbid that you're ever angry with your brother, then you're going to, you're going, you're in danger of judgment. If you're angry with your brother, you got to be positive towards your brother at all times. You got to be positive towards your sister at all times. That whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. It's another example. You have righteous anger and you have unrighteous anger. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. You got to understand what it's talking about. You calling somebody a fool. You better make sure what you're saying. You better make sure. Orion's belt. You know what Orion means? Orion means fool. The Bible references Orion. Who do you think Orion is? Who do you think the fool is? The ultimate fool is Satan, Lucifer, and his angels, his devils. Don't be calling folks something you ain't sure what they are or who you're addressing. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? How many times should I forgive my brother, Lord? You talking this forgiveness talk. You want me to keep on forgiving my brother even though he keep on sinning against me? Is that what you're telling me, Lord? Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, if he sin against you, rebuke him. And if he what? If he repent, forgive him. Oh, 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 hold on, hold on. How many times have you heard that preached? All you hear about is forgiveness, 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 forgive, 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 forgive. But Jesus himself said, if thy brother trespass against thee, the first thing you do is what? You rebuke him. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And if he repent, forgive him. Now we're talking about true believers who are truly in the spirit because they have the power to retain, remit sins. And I'm going to get to that. So rebuke your brother if he sinned against you. I mean, you tell him what he was wrong at in love. And if he repent, you must forgive him because your father has forgiven you. But guess what? If he doesn't repent toward you, also toward God, then you're not obligated to remove his sin that he has sinned against you. You take it before the Lord and then you keep that sin upon him so hopefully he can see the error of his way. You're not going to hear this halfway preached in these so-called church buildings. 
again, this is for the more grounded in the faith. I know some of you are like, Brother King, you're saying that we aren't supposed to forgive, and that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and in, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying what? I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So we go back up. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus is pretty much responding. If your brother sinned against you, Peter, you rebuke him. And if he repent, you forgive him. And if he sinned against you seven times, because you brought up the point seven times, and seven times he turns again, again, he turns again to you, and he's, he's saying that he repents, he's truly sorry, you, you forgive him. Because you're going to do some things against your brother and your sister too. And you're not going to mean to do it. And you're going to, because you love your brother and you love your sister, you're going to go to them and you're going to apologize. And truly be sorry. And then they're going to forgive you because they love you too. And they rather have that, that relationship that y'all do have than, than to not have it. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse number 12. But when ye sin, so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Oh, now we're getting deep into it. So when you sin against your brother, you're wounding them, which means that you're sinning against Christ. You're sinning against your own body. That's why you have to forgive when they repent so they can be healed. So the body can be healed. So you can be healed too. Because if you got a brother or sister in Christ and they sin against you, let's say they stole something from you. That doesn't, it, who's, who's it hurt more? It hurts you. It hurts you because you're like, dang, I thought we was better than that. They stole from me. I let them in my house, around my children, around my, my wife or my husband, if, you, if you're a woman, and they stole from me? They could have asked what I would have gave them that. It hurts you more. It don't hurt them as much because <laughs> they don't want to get caught. If it, if it did hurt them, then it would bring it back. So now both, they come to you and they repent. Now that both of you are reconciled in the love, the love is what's going to heal. That's why he said to forgive them. But when ye sin, but when ye, but when ye sin, so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. So then repenting and you forgiving them is so that the wound can be healed. Because if they're coming to you and they're um, truly sorry, excuse me, and you're going to harbor that grudge and resentment against them, and you see they're truly sorry, now you're in the sin. Now you're sinning against Christ. Because how many times have you messed up since being born again and God has forgiven you? God has given you the grace and mercy and strengthened you to get back up to continue to push forward and not and not do those things. Matthew chapter 12, verse 48. Because people will say, oh, see, that's my, that's my brother right there. That's my brother. People will think that this extends to the lost. No. No, it does not. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let them be anathema maranatha. Let their sins remain upon them. Your sins are removed when you come into the love of God through the gospel. 
You can't be removing somebody's sins. You can't be removing the unclean spirits and then you remove the unclean spirits. Then they don't have the, the spirit dwelling in them. And then the devils come. They bring seven more devils more wicked than themselves. Prove it, brother king. Okay. But he answered and said unto him that told him, who is my mother? And who are my brethren? Those to do the will of my father in heaven. The true born again believers, those are our brothers and sisters. That is our family. That is our family. Again, Mark 3, 33. And he answered them saying, who is my mother? Or my brethren. Remember, they were they at, they came to him and said, "Your your your mom, your 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 mom, your brother. They desire to speak to you." And Jesus responds with this: "Those who do the will of his Father. That is the family of God." John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. So here he is giving peace through his words, because we know the power of words, to his disciples. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Oh, that's some power right there. So when they received the Holy Ghost, what authority did he give them? Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. You see, the, 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 the Catholic Church tried to teach that the Pope, his followers, they have the power to forgive or to not forgive sins. But the truth of the matter is, the believers in Christ, we have the power. We have been given the power through the Spirit by the Lord Jesus Christ to remit or retain sins. This is for the more mature in the Lord. You can't be walking around, oh, I'm not going to forgive this sin. You got to understand. If you don't understand it, don't mess with it. Don't bring that judgment upon yourself. I've studied this out maybe two years ago. Maybe two years ago, I studied this out. It wasn't until later that I actually brought it up to my wife. We was having the Bible study. It was my wife and I think her mama. And even they didn't get it at the time. And I had to break it down and explain it to them. I wasn't even going to speak it to them because I, I didn't I didn't think they were they were ready. Because this is something that you're not going to hear a lot about. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. What does the word remit mean? Remit, to send back, to sin, to relax, to make less tense or violent, to forgive, to surrender the right of, crime, of punish, punish, excuse me, to surrender the right of punishing a crime to remit punishment, to pardon as a fault or crime. Whosoever sins ye pardon, whosoever sins ye surrender, whosoever sins you send back, whosoever sins you relax, they are pardoned. Whosoever sins ye pardon, they are pardoned. And whosoever sins ye retain, 
they are retained. So what does retain mean? We know what it means. Let's get, let's get a deeper understanding. Whosoever sins you hold, retain, to hold or keep in possession, not to lose or part with or dismiss. To keep, to hold from escape. And whosoever sins you hold or keep in possession, meaning that they keep in, they, their sins are still upon them, those sins are kept upon them. How many times do you hear that preached? Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. We got to have an understanding of the power that we have tr truly been given. We got to understand the power of God that we have truly been given. What Jesus just said, if the disciples, they have the Holy Ghost in them during that time, and we now have the Holy Ghost in us, and Jesus told his disciples that greater works that they would do than what he did, then what does that mean for us? Oh, brother, we don't have that power today. So the Holy Spirit just changed all of a sudden. It's a different Holy Spirit. So you're saying it's a different Holy Spirit that they had than what we have. That's what, that's what you're saying. Because if it's the same spirit that the disciples had, that that excuse me they, that they have present tense that we now have then that means that we also would have the power to remit or retain sins oh only god can do that absolutely but god gave the power to jesus and jesus gave it to us first corinthians the word talks about that we are going to judge the world and we're also going to judge angels we're going to judge angels? Absolutely. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Notice they didn't say, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us. They said the devils are subject unto us through his name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power. Let's read it one more time. Behold, I give unto you power. We, we always talk about the power of God, but we don't have an understanding of it. So let's get an understanding. To what? To uh, tread on serpents and scorpions. What's the context? Devils. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be, by any means hurt you. Jesus said that he, he beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. How does Satan fall from heaven? Because God casts his wicked butt down. God, by his power, by his word, he casts Satan down from heaven. So he's saying that I've given you the same power to cast devils down from heaven. I've given you the same power to cast them out. You heard me say in my previous sermon that we're not just in we're not just fighting this war in, in this physical this physical realm right here. We're not fighting this spiritual war just here on earth. We're also fighting the second heaven. That's why the war breaks out in heaven. When it talks about that Michael stands up and he fights for Israel, and then Michael and his angels fight against the dragon and his angels. Majority of us are going to be a part of that war when it happens because we're going to be caught up before then or we're going to die before then. 
and then we're going to be in that war. And then they're going to be cast down from the second heaven down here to the first heaven, which is here on earth. And then guess what? There's going to be a war right here too. Y'all hear me talk about everything is a, is a microcosm of something greater. The war broke out in the, in the third heaven first. Then it comes down to the second heaven. Then, then the, um, the first heaven. The story is the same. Three different witnesses. <laughs> Three different witnesses. Just like it talks about in the book of uh, 1 John. <gasps> Excuse me. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in where? In heaven. So don't rejoice because the devil's, the spirits are subject to you. That's, that's nothing. Rejoice that you have the salvation for you to be able to even do that. Rejoice that you have the salvation to be, to be able to even to remit or retain sins. That God has found you worthy to give you his power, to give you his spirit, to be able to do these things. Rejoice in the love. Rejoice in the love. Because your name can only be written in heaven if you are in the love of God. That's how your name gets written in heaven. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. And I will give unto thee the king, excuse me, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound where? On earth? No, it says in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So there's a correlation between the two. So the things that you're doing here on the earth, you're also doing it in heaven. Y'all know I talk about, these, talk about these things. And you know, if I don't give you the scripture right then, and sometimes I purposely don't because I want you to think about it and I want you to see God on it. But eventually I'm going to give you the scriptures. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, that means I'm here on earth, shall be bound in heaven. So if I'm binding something on earth, the same thing is being bound in heaven. If I'm loosing something here on earth, that means that something is being loosed in heaven also. If I'm retaining somebody's sins here on earth, that means I'm retaining their sins in heaven. If I'm loosing their sins on earth because they are truly sorry, then I'm loosing their sins in heaven also. God is having mercy and grace upon them. He specifically, okay, I'm listening to the prayers of my, my people. Send the mercy and grace to that person right there because my son and my daughter, they're praying for them. They want, they, they, they make it happen. I see their love. Honor their love and then give them double blessing too because they're so humble. Matthew chapter seven, we're going to read a little bit of this. Judge not that ye be not judged. See, see, we're not supposed to judge. Oh, judgmental Christians. Guess what? I'm a judgmental Christian. I judge in righteousness. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. So if you judge with an earthly judgment, then you will be judged with that. If you judge with a hypocritical judgment, then you will be judged with that. If you judge with a righteous judgment, then you will be judged with a righteous judgment. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. If you judge with a judgment of hatred, then if you uh, judge with a judgment of hatred times 20, I'm talking about the, 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 the murderous hatred. I ain't talking about the righteous one that we just, we discussed. Then that's that it's going to be measured to you more than what you put out. Don't as the old saying goes, don't dish 
Don't dish out what you can't handle. If you're calling for a higher standard, then make sure that you can be judged by that same standard and uphold that standard. My wife would tell you that I require a lot from her because of the position that I am in. But I cannot sit here and require a lot from my wife and then think that the Lord isn't going to require a lot from me. That is hypocritical. I cannot sit here and set a standard for her in regards to different ministry stuff and getting things done, but then I'm not getting stuff done either. That's hypocritical, and then I will be judged that much more worse. But if I'm leading by example, and she sees me out here, she sees my labor of love, not only for the Lord, but also for her and our son, and then I require um, a greater sacrifice from her, require her to do more things, then she can't say anything. She can say, okay, I, I, I need, I'm going to need some help with this, but I got you. Because now she has no excuse either because she see me doing it and that's going to motivate her. She's not going to have any excuse because if I can do it, she can do it because we have the same spirit dwelling in us. So what's the context of Matthew 7, brother? And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? It's talking about hypocritical judgment. The same thing I just explained. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Look what he says after this. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eyes and own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. He didn't say anything about not to judge at all. He said, make sure that whatever you're trying to judge your brother on, you don't have it in your eye. Oh, you trying to you trying to you trying to um judge your brother or sister about smoking cigarettes, but you got a cigarette in your mouth. You got a pack of cigarettes in your pocket. You got ashes all over your car. Your house smells like straight up cigarettes because you smoking everywhere. You you like a a, a a a living chimney. But you trying to get on somebody else about smoking and everything. Thou hypocrite, take the cigarette, the beam, out of your own eye first. I'm using the cigarette as an example. And then thou shalt see clearly, you can see the consequences of smoking and why you shouldn't be doing it to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Hey, let me, let me tell you something, brother. Let me, let me talk to you should be doing that. And let me tell you why. Now, I, I used to smoke for 40 years and I got lung cancer. I went to the doctors. The doctors told me that I was going to die. I didn't care. I kept on smoking. But I got saved, born again by the blood of Jesus. The gospel saved me. God showed me how wicked I was and what I was doing to my body and what I, what I was also doing to, to him and others and how my smoking was affecting others. My family, you know, my wife, my kids. My kids didn't want to be around me because I smelled like smoke. My wife didn't want to be, be around me. She didn't want to give me, give me none. You know, I just, my life just started going down the drain. Didn't care. I, I lost hope. My wife went to the doctor with me and the doctor told me I was, I, I was going, I had not too long to live, but I kept on smoking, not thinking about how it affected my family. But when I got saved, 
My mindset changed. I came to repentance. I saw that my, the, the, the decisions that I was making to continue smoking, I saw how they affected my family. I saw how it affected others. God showed me the light. He showed me that, the, that, that, that he showed me that there was different people in my life that they looked up to me. And if I continued on this path of smoking myself into a grave, that my death was going to affect not only my family, but the other people that I didn't know that looked up to me. So I'm here to tell you, my brother or my sister, that is smoking these cigarettes or whatever it may be. That you need to stop that. But you can't stop on your own. You need to bring it before the Lord. You need to call out to God for mercy and grace and have him to take the taste of those cigarettes out your mouth. Have him to take the taste of the of that ungodly lust and have a, a righteous lust towards your wife or your husband. A hunger uh, toward your wife or husband to make love to them and not make love to everybody else. Are we understanding? Don't be a hypocrite. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. The Bible talks about in the book of Revelation that outside the temple are the dogs and all these different things. Why are you giving it to them? When you've given somebody the truth, you're not obligated to give them the deep wisdom and the mysteries of God if they're not receiving even the basic stuff. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine. What did Jesus say? Store up your riches in heaven. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find it. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Oh, I'm asking. I'm, I'm, I'm asking God. God didn't say when he was going to give it to you. Oh, I'm seeking. But I ain't found it yet. Well, maybe you ain't seeking hard enough. How do you know the seeking, your seeking may take you a week. You seeking something may take you a year, two years, three years. Certain things that I preach, it took me years to, to get it, but I kept on seeking. I kept on searching. I kept on knocking and God kept on opening up different doors and I went through those doors. God can open up a door for you, but you have to walk through the door. Or oh, what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? So this is what people are saying. They're saying that they're asking God for different things, and they're saying that God didn't give it to them. He gave me a stone. They're seeking different things, the different mysteries and the treasures of God, but then when they go find the treasure, they're saying that it was a stone. This ain't no treasure. This is a stone. They're knocking, and then God is opening the door, and they're saying that, well, God didn't, make the rock, God didn't split the rock for the water to come through. He ain't gave me nothing to drink out of nothing. Come on now. Come on now. now. Now you're taking the, the name. Excuse me. I know I talk fast sometimes. Y'all bear with me. Now you're taking the name of the Lord in vain. Now you're bearing false witness against the very God that you are claiming. Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? That's what y'all saying. Lord, I'm hungry. I'm going to give you a serpent to bite you, though. God playing, God, he playing games with me. God ain't playing no games with you. If he playing games with you, because you, you act like a fool. So he's trying to show you. But if you serious, he going to take care of you.
And even if you, when you ain't serious, his grace and mercy still rains down upon you. If ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, excuse me, excuse me, <clears throat> therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Oh my God. This is what the whole law and what the prophets were saying. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do to others as you have done unto you. I don't do I don't do anything to my wife that I wouldn't want done to myself. If I'm hard on my wife, it's because that I want her to be hard on me if I ain't on my job. If I'm pushing my wife to do more for the Lord, then it's because I want her and I want others to do the same for me, to me, to bring out help to bring out the best in me. I gotta read that one more time. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So he tells you what all the law was about. He tells you. But he also tells us to go above and beyond. They're doing that. Okay, don't worry about them. You keep on doing what you're supposed to do. Are oh, they treating you that type of way? Don't worry about that. You keep on doing what you're supposed to do. You keep on, you keep on um, manifesting love. Oh, they don't want to listen. Okay, they ain't got to listen. Go, go, go preach. Go preach to somebody that that, that does want to listen. I seen somebody, so you can manifest and shine light to them. Don't worry about them. Now they come to you, you show them love now. Because I may put you in a situation where you, you know what I'm saying, I'm going to try and test you. But if somebody ain't receiving the gospel, you're not obligated to keep on preaching to them. It doesn't mean you hate them. It just means that you ain't finna waste your time. You don't know how long you're promised. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verses 12 through 16. And when ye come into a and when ye come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, so there's a stipulation. If the house be worthy, what? Let your peace come upon it. But if stipulation, it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. I'm going to give y'all a testimony. I used to rent a house. It was three of us. It was an older guy. We called him Unc. It was a younger guy. I'm going to say his name was uh, CW. And it was me. CW and Unc, they were family. And they had this house. And I came along looking for a place to stay and stuff like that. I was going to get my own apartment or house or whatever. And we ended up getting, we was cool. And so he said, hey, man, you know what I'm saying? You can, you can come over here with us. And we can split the bills three ways. And we got to talk about it. I was like, yeah, that, that, that sounds pretty good. I said, I said, then, you know. I said, that, that way all of us can save some money. And then we can take our money, we can do some other things. He's like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. So I end up going to his house. I was still wet behind the ears. That was like, that was like right before, right before I started ministry. Right before I started ministry, I was fresh. I was fresh out the womb, <laughs> fresh out the womb. Either I was about to be saved, or I was fresh out the womb. And... 
eventually I grew and grew in the Lord as I was there. And the tension started to rise up. Like we was cool at first. Everything was cool. But as I, as I, as my love started to grow, as my knowledge and wisdom and understanding in the Lord started to grow, I started to see different things. I started to be less ignorant. In my relationship with CW, Unk, he wasn't really there. Unk was only there like probably like a day, a day out the week. And you know, when he was there, he was only there for a few hours. He may be in, you see him then gone, and he'd be gone for like two or three days. So me and CW was real close. Used to have barbecues. He used to barbecue and stuff. Used to, you know, get in the kitchen and cook up, cook up some good meals and everything. Watch some movies and stuff like that. He used to have his girl over. You know what I'm saying? You know, just chill. You just chill. But the tension started to grow between us because I really started to see who they really were. And eventually got to the point where I didn't even want to come out my room because I saw the the literal spirit of. Antichrist, and not only himself, but his his girlfriend. And eventually, I got to the point where the, the tension was so high, I said, I got to go. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I don't care if I got to live in my, my truck. I got to get out of here. And eventually, I left. And you know what happened when I left? Because I read that scripture and I understood it way back then. I took my peace from that place. And as God is my witness, I didn't know this because I wasn't looking for it, but it was on the news. It was a new, it was a news clip. CW was on the new, on the news. And it was a story. Cause he said, yeah, I, he said, yeah, I was on the news. Y'all. He was on Facebook. He said, yeah, I was on the news. Y'all. I like, dang, Corey's on the news. I gave his name away, but <laughs> He's on the news and he was talking about how a tree fell through the house and almost crushed him and his dad. And they were only a few seconds away from something worse happening. They were, I think they were watching foot, uh, football. I don't know if it was a Super Bowl or whatever. And they heard something, tree came down through the house, inches away from where they were sitting at in the living room, destroyed the house and even destroyed the foundation. Now, how do you think my, what do you think my response was when I saw that? I knew that it was judgment upon, upon them. I knew it was because I took my peace from that place when I left. But guess what? I was shocked when it, I was shocked when it happened. I didn't gloat and say, oh yeah, yeah, see, see, see. I was like, wow, this is, this is real. Lord, I pray you say, I pray you save him. I think I even made a post about it or video about it a while back. Hoping that he would see it, hoping that he would understand. I even reached out to him and said, "Hey, man, you know, I heard what happened." Yeah, I'm like, "Yeah, man, you know, you get you gotta be careful of those type of things. A certain things happen for a certain for you know, what I'm saying for a certain reason. You know, it's, it's up to us to find out why they happen." I didn't gloat in that happening, but I knew why it did happen. True story. God is my witness. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not, but if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. How do we receive peace? We receive peace through the gospel. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable 
for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That's some real power. And when I tell you that happened, and I found out after that a tree had fell to their house and I knew what I had prayed and God brought it back to my, my remembrance, I was like, whoa, this is serious. I knew why, why it had happened. I took my peace from that place, from that house when I left. And God was issuing a warning and he was also letting me know some things. And I'm now letting you know those things that he has shown me. This is not a game. The power that we have within us, if you are truly born again, it's not a game. It's not a power. It's not a, a, um, a power to be playing with. Like people play with Ouija boards and stuff like that and think it's a game. You have the power to remit or retain sins. You have the power to bind and loose. You have the power to let your peace be upon a place or to take your peace from that place. But also, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. There are certain people out there that want to label me false prophet and false teacher. This ain't what you want because I understand these scriptures. I understand this power and don't think that I won't use it in righteousness. If you've been a part of this ministry and you decide, oh, I don't want to be a part of it. And you want to call me a false prophet and false teacher and make videos and bear false witness against me. Daryl. Chuck Middleton, Frida. Oh, yeah, I call y'all by name. And all y'all that roll with them. Husky 394 XP. I call them out by name. Guess what I'm going to do? Or guess what I have done? I've taken my peace. Because you were only sitting under the peace that I truly have instead of having your own peace. So I've taken my peace. My peace has returned from me to me. Excuse me. Because your house is not worthy. The house, the spiritual house you're building up is not worthy. I feel sorry for you. It's not a game. I don't play games. So with that being said, um, hopefully this gave you a better understanding of what Jesus was talking about, what the scriptures are talking about in regards to hate, in regards to love, in regards to the, the power that we truly have. Hopefully you have a better understanding of uh, righteous hatred um, and unrighteous hatred. And if you don't, then you can watch the video again. You can um, pray about it. You can you can also contact me. We can talk on the phone, and I can expound on it more. But those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. So, with that being said, God bless each and every one of you. In Jesus Christ's name, as always, stay focused for Jesus. And as you know, truth is not debated. It is declared. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If it was edifying to you, be sure to do your part and share it on all your social media outlets, websites, and forums. Your help is greatly appreciated to help fight this war and reach lost souls. Don't forget to like, dislike, and or subscribe. Be sure to also check out our website, stayingfocusedforjesus.com.
life and make sure you check out that resource section which has a lot of videos that i share and some other stuff books um, documents pdf websites many many things and it's growing daily as i add to it also follow us on facebook for even more content staying focused for jesus on facebook Because you say I am rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing And no, oh no, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked So then because you are lukewarm and neither could know Jesus said that he would spit you out of his mouth. Stop playing church. We become something else, something worse, something more like the world. Where is the church? We become something. Jesus said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, clothed in white raiment to hide the shame of your nakedness. So then because you Jesus said that he would spit you out of his mouth. Stop playing church. We become something else, something worse, something more like the world. Where is the church? We become something else, neither hot nor cold. You say you a Christian, living yeah. like a child to hell, you a Christian Go to church, say the sinner's prayer, you a Christian Stay getting high, getting throwed, yeah Monday through Saturday, anything go, yeah Caught up in the world and left your first love Jesus died in your place, he shed his precious blood But you gotta be seen, pastor, apostle Wake up, church, time to go and preach the gospel